You're listening to The Ride Fearless Show. I'm your host, Sydney Blanchard, and I have my fearless friend with me, Sabrina Devers. Hunter jumpers to cutting horses, to barrel horses, team rubbing horses, um, NFR horses, VFA world champions. Um, we just specialize in getting a person with the right horse. And that, that um, I remember back the first time that we had sold a horse for a hundred thousand and I thought, Oh, that's all the money in the world. And now anymore, it's like, well, (laughs) it's just another day. (laughs) Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So you say, you know, that used to be a lot of money, um, a hundred thousand for a horse. And you're talking about several different disciplines, not just barrel racing. You guys have steer wrestling horses, rope horses. And, um, but what people don't understand is what goes into making a horse competitive and reaching the elite level i mean we have more than that sad to say i hate to look at it but i've seen my books we just did our taxes like we have more than that in our horses you know so it's like well to make money <laughs> it's got to be well over right. the hundred thousand mark i always tell my my because i sell for a lot of trainers and uh, you know i tell them you know you at least make 50 cents on the hour <laughs> because oh god <laughs> By the time that you haul them, you've trained them, you, you've got your entry fees, you've got your stud fees. I mean, but on the good side, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, that breeders were having trouble even covering what the stud fees were, much less raise them to be two- and three-year-olds and then sell their product. Now the market, actually, you can make money with the industry, and I think... You know, things like the pink buckle and the ruby buckle, those incentives have allowed the horse market to step up with that younger market. The market has always been strong for your rodeo horses because, you know, you've been to the bar, it does pay. So those horses are worth so much because it's, it is so competitive out there now. You know, the horses, your maintenance is better, they have longer longevity, but the level that they have to run at to be that 1%. And I'll tell people, because you see on the market, oh, I've got a 1D horse. Uh, Well, there's different areas for different 1D horses. There are different areas that have more 1D horses. And, you know, whether you're looking at local pen or you're going to your bigger super shows, you know, that's that, you know, that's going to make a difference on what that horse is. Like, for instance, today, I've got three horses coming in. Uh, I've got two customers coming in. Uh, my market is really strong for those horses that are easy to get along with. Mm-hmm. I do sell barrel maturity prospects, um, but that is kind of a market that has kind of a top end and then a marginal end. And I kind of like that open end. You know, I want to, my market, I want to sell someone and bring them along. So say you have a, a customer that is just getting in. It doesn't matter if it's a youth or an adult. I want to get that horse to bring them along. And, and, and I'll tell them, don't, don't get stuck on this horse forever because we're going to move you up the ladder. You know, right. We're going to start you out you know, and then we'll move you up. And that's how you're keeping your clientele coming back as well. And that's kind of, and it seems like you're really emotionally invested in these people. You're not just looking at them like a check, right? Because it is such a small community that you have to have repeat customers. So you can't just, you know, look at somebody like, um, like a payday one time. You really do want to be a part of their team and they're looking for somebody to be a part of their team. I've had the same phone number for 35 years and the same oh facility for 32. So they know where I'm at and they know, and I don't want to have a phone call at, at four o'clock in the morning unhappy with the horse. Yeah. I would much rather pass on a sale. If it doesn't fit, then, you know, there's been times I've just told, hey, it's not going to work. This is not, I know you want this particular horse. I don't feel comfortable with this. So let's just pass and let's go to lunch and we'll find you another one. Yeah, and they respect you for that. So what do you do? Like I've had experiences like that where I thought I sold a horse to somebody and that was going to be the perfect fit. And, you know, down the road, it just wasn't working out and they are unhappy. Like what do you, what are the next steps that you take as a professional? Okay, for example, um... I sold a horse uh, four months ago, and I was worried about it at the time. But the the hand was, she's a really good hand. 
and but her her natural style is a push stop mm -hmm. and that's what she had already won on and i had had this customer since they were eight and they are junior in college now so i've had them a long time i don't try to go wide i don't try to go get new customers i just mm -hmm. try to take care of the one that i have down in my okay. down line keep them winning and that's a full-time job by the time that they send their friends and their and their relatives to me to get them to winning on a program so for her i'd had her for a long time and i told her i i just don't know if this is going to work with this change of style mm -hmm. but they were like you know we need to expand our horsemanship we want to try uh, some things different well it wasn't her style and so what I did is I got that one in, sold that one, got her one that did fit the style that I was comfortable with, and she immediately went and won at two rodeos. So I try to rectify something if it's not working. Mm -hmm. Or, and you know, you get customers, too, that they buy an expensive horse or a cheap horse. It doesn't matter. You know, people sometimes, you know, $10,000 is a huge <laughs> amount for them. Right. You know, you got to take care of those people, even – even a, a cheaper horse than that, um, mm -hmm. and which really gets difficult. But say they decide the, you know, their kid decides I'm going to get a car and get rid of the horse. Then I've got to be comfortable with that first initial sale that I can get them out from under that horse. And I think mm -hmm. that's the key to what we do. We don't leave them hanging. And when you say that, that you're going to get them out from under the horse or um, not leaving them hanging, so your steps are you'll take them in. So what you have, you're not just sitting on the phone all day. You are a competitive, talented barrel racer and trainer. So you can take these horses, and what do you do? You fix them and then and then send them back out or fix them? Yep, yep. Uh, what I do, I get them in. I evaluate where we're at. Have we got a physical issue going on? Do we have... You know, if we got some training issues that we've changed up that this was not normal for this horse, we fix them. So um, I ride several different styles. I am a jump rider, which when people come in and they want to go try a horse at a barrel race, and it's like, oh, let me tell you, even the best of hands, look them at, look at them at the NFR. They went at least a really high-end horse, but it didn't fit. It will make you look like Ned in the first reader. I'm telling you, don't go to the barrel race to go try out the horse. Um I will get the horses in, and I will see where we're at, fix problems if we got them. And, and sometimes it's not a problem with the horse. It's just not a match, or uh, they've got some maintenance issues they've kind of let go, or they did not understand what maintenance is. Uh, we run into that a lot. Or they get things like EPM. Mm -hmm. You know, the EPM affects a lot of different areas, and those horses, they didn't understand they even had an issue. We, we clean up those horses. We're a rehab station. So we fix whatever issues they've got, get that horse back to being a, a sellable item or um, like one two weeks ago came in and I went, you've wrecked him. There's nothing there that I can fix because you've wrecked him. Uh, when you physically break them, they're like a car. They're not the same individual. Uh, there are instances that you can't fix. And, and is so that... I have to pack is that something that you tell them? Like you just say you yeah. you did this, or or do you kind of try to walk on eggshells around it and and just be like, oh well, he didn't hold up, or do you tell them like you did this, you ran this horse too much, you didn't have him maintained, or like do you give them the the reaping? <laughs> I am known to be very blunt, which offends some people. Um, but that's why but we're, that's we're friends because you're blunt for some reason I love that I'm like that girl's honest I know exactly who she is when I walk up to her <laughs> straight up you know and, and they know I mean I have people especially people that don't know me and will try to slide one in on me like send me something that's bad at the gate and then go oh it's never been bad before. Mm -hmm. Well, I take it to the first event, and, and I'm not a tourist. I know that this, and I'll call them up and say, this yeah. horse is going back home because you have a major gate issue, or uh, oh, three months ago they sent me one a long distance, and I was excited to get this horse in, will, really well bred, but mysteriously didn't have a lot of current earnings and hadn't had current earnings in quite some time, so I was a little bit skeptical, and then when I – you know, and I did my research. I go back and I check on these horses. I check on these horses because I have people everywhere. I will say, I'll call up my buddies and say, hey, have you seen this horse run? What did it do? 
what, what are they like at in the parking lot? Yeah. Because it's not always what's in the arena that is making that horse worth what it is or not worth what it is. Right. Well, they see the one that uh, took him to the barrel race, warmed up good. I'm thinking, hmm, looks good. I go to the first barrel. I'm shaping the horse because, again, I'm a jump rider. I'm not a tourist. I go to the first barrel, and that sucker took me around the pen. I went, called him up and said, first shipping home, not staying here. And they were like, oh. Yeah, I was like, no, 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 I, I don't deal in trash. And I think that's one of the reasons <laughs> we sell a lot of horses because uh, I sold one uh, Monday uh, to one of our customers. They had a horse get hurt. They've got final coming up this week. I said, I know exactly what horse will fit you. Got them to meet 45 minutes. And he calls me up and said, you know us. You know what we need. And, you know, so that works for me. But I, I'm real particular on what I'll sell. That makes a difference. I can see how that makes a difference. What happens when, um, like, have you ever been blasted with social media being the way it is now? And I call it the internet trolls. Like, there's a, yeah. There, okay, I know. I'm all into the rap songs now. I'm, like, the preppy girl that's into, like, the super dark rap. So there's Glorilla, and she has a she has this internet trolls song. You'll have to listen to it. But it's so funny. And it makes me think about that because um, I've been blasted on social media, but I just block the people. You know what I mean? I'm like, you know, just hit the block button. And there was one time where I sold a horse that um, a girl had created a fake account. And she was, she had had the horse and was trying to sell it originally. Didn't get it sold. Um, It got sent to me and I got blasted that I was trying to sell a horse that was crippled and that didn't pass a vet check. So I went Facebook Live with a vet during the vet check of the horse of the girl the girl that was buying and she was fine with it the vet was fine with it and he passed and he went on to win the las vegas super show so i i got lucky like you know what i mean like i'm like okay you know that was god's little wink of being like no i'm gonna clear your name for you but it doesn't always work like that so have you had that experience and if you have like how did you get through that what do you do i am so lucky oh knock on wood (laughs) it's going to be. Oh, I'm getting on Facebook okay. right now. <laughs> I've been in the business for so long. Like, I've never had a real job. It, 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 you know, never had a real job. So, and I saw my first horse when I was six years old. So, let's see, 50 years of selling horses. So, when you're in this business, you expect somebody to be unhappy with you. But knock on wood, the only thing that I ever had, and they had mentioned my name on, they have that uh, barrel horse world forum Mm -hmm. you know where they have topics and they said what do you think about sabrina devers and and somebody texted me real fast oh they're putting your name on on the forum i was like oh good lord what what are they gonna say luckily this woman gets on there and she said well i'll tell you what she said i sent a horse to her i could not communicate with her she didn't answer the phone i you know could not hear from her she said but i will tell you this She did sell my horse. She got her a good home. And when I was ready to buy one, I bought one from her. And it was, it was exactly, but communication. She does. And and it's true. I am terrible (laughs) at being able to catch me on the phone. You can text me. I'm I'm usually trying to catch my text, but I am hard to reach because we're just, we're just swamped here. Mm -hmm. By the time that you ride the horses, you're doing your maintenance, you're doing your ads. I do ads at two o'clock in the morning. You know, I do my, my videos. I do my research on these horses. And, you know, by the time you do all that, I calling the owners back and saying, you know, Fufu ate her food today. And, you know, we brushed her three strokes around her mane. You know, <laughs> it, 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 I, I'm right. not getting it done. You know? So that, that would be the only thing. That's the only thing they've ever said about me. But I have definitely, when I've had people unhappy with the purchase, I have bent over backwards to fix it for them, Mm -hmm. you know, to do whatever I can do to make it right. And so I think, um, I think, you know, and I'm a broker, I'm not a horse trader. And there's, there's a difference Mm -hmm. there too. Right. I can be selective. I don't have to sell a horse today to eat tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm at that stage of my life. I am very particular Mm -hmm. and that, that thing's pretty clean. Mm Mm-hmm. I could, um, I hate that, that, you know, the horse, the horse trader thing. And I mean, that's, it's something that people are really proud of and it's what they do and it's how they get food on the table and each to their own. But I think that it gives people like you who are brokers, um, kind of a, 
a more, you know, not a negative type idea mm-hmm. around it. Um, and what this podcast, I hope people like really understand that, you know, there's professional horse brokers that you can use and you are one of them and you're very successful at it. So, um, I'm trying to think back to what you were saying about taking a horse back in for somebody and bending over backwards. So when you get a horse back, do you charge them for like feed and board and riding them and then take your commission? And then my other question is, if you, do you take a higher commission if you have the horse in hand versus, um, if they're keeping the horse at their house and you're, and you're just, um, you know, giving them a client? Right. Uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, new customers will come to me and want me to sell their horse. And they'll say, and you work on a 10% commission, right? No, I haven't worked on a 10% commission in 30, 35 years. I've been 15%. But I'll tell them, you know, the thing is, the difference between me is um, the cheaper that you get a person to work for you, they're going to figure out things to make it even up. I'm straight up at 15% or a price over is how I do mine. If somebody comes and says, you know, I'm worried about spending this for my board. You know, I don't want to pay for the training. Well, then you better send me something that I'm not going to have to train, not going to have to tune up. Mm-hmm. Because by the time that I haul them to a barrel race and I do an exhibition and, and haul them on my gas, my truck, my time, then I've got an investment. You know, every time that I take a horse in, the things people don't understand. I spend at least mm-hmm. at least five hundred to start out on that horse, mm-hmm. and that's you know that's not just my ads, but that's just doing my research. It, you know, and again, fifty cents on the hour. <laughs> <laughs> Set that up. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's an investment for me to take that horse in. I have to you know evaluate: is this going to be worth my initial work on it? Because, um, you know, in the real estate market, people have their houses ready. Mm-hmm. In this market, the house comes to me and I got to start cleaning it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you have to do all the maintenance and clean it. That's, I love that analogy. That's so funny. So um, I have, uh, people are always super surprised. Like when you take a horse for them. So I do more training than selling for other people. Unless, like you said, like I'll, I'll get one where I know, I mean, I have the whole team fearless horses, so they have to be fearless, you know? And I, I'll tell them like, man, I really just can't sell that horse for you. You know what I mean? If it has an alley problem or, you know, it is injured, you know, and it's something like that. Like, it's just, I'm not the person for you. But when I do get horses in, I've been keeping track. I have like that self-employed QuickBooks app so I can just have my invoices on my phone. Well, I'll split the fuel. So say I take my six horse and have one of your horses and I have it loaded with six horses, then you're only paying a six of the fuel. You know what I mean? And so, and I do that. And then the entry fees and the exhibitions. And then of course I charge, um, a set fee for riding them that day. And it adds, and then the, the feed, and then it rains here. So then they're in a stall and the shavings. And then all of a sudden these people get a bill and they're like, what the heck, this isn't what you're quoting. I'm like, well, I quoted you the training. Like the rest of it is what you would be, you know, paying anyways, if you were taking the horse. So it gets, it gets so expensive. And, um, with that said, so with what you do with it, you know, cause that bill can get higher than what a person even wants for the horse sometimes, depending on what they have the horse priced at. So do you have a set time that you'll keep a horse before you send it back? Yeah. Uh, I, I look at it. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons I get 15% instead of people that are getting 10% because I figure in on that 15% as part of the, you know, like I throw in the gas, you know, for hauling that horse. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that get thrown in, you know, feature blitz ads, um, uh, you know, all, I have a lot of periodical ads too, that are out there in, in all the magazines too, that people don't even consider, you know, what I'm spending on it, but they see the results. The I'm um, saying whether I keep a horse, you know, X amount of time. I try to have those horses. I already try to have a basis. I want at least three customers before I bring that horse in. Okay. So when somebody tells me, you know, I've got this horse. I the, I have them send me the uh, the videos. Let me evaluate those videos, and then let me do my research and decide do I have a market for this horse. And if I do, 
you know, the older horses are the harder ones to sell. And those are the ones that they always want to send you. The horses, and I say older, the, the 14 to 20 year olds. The 13 year olds are, you know, that's getting on your, your mm-hmm. end of your age, you know, for, for higher end sell. And I sell so many higher end horses. They're good horses, but when they get a, an age, they start devaluating. Um, so I, I try not to overload too many horses i try to keep a certain amount in a certain age range Mm -hmm. certain amount in a certain price range i try to at least when a customer comes in have two to three horses that fit their criteria in here and i try to keep it a variety of levels of horses so that i can fit that market and i try not to send a lot of horses in here that i don't think i'm going to have a market for so i'm pretty selective on that too i try to have those horses in and out of here Hopefully, you know, my target is 30 days, but I give myself 60. Okay. If I'm passing 60 mark, then I'm kind of like, okay, now we need to adjust either the price on this horse or I need to move this horse to another broker. I have no problem sending a horse to another person to sell mm-hmm. or another person to ride that fits that horse better. Mm-hmm. You know, wherever wherever that horse is going to look the best, mm-hmm. that's where I want it to go. I could do a whole podcast about your, your, just your business mind, because I mean, don't take any type of offense to this, but anytime I speak to you about business, it's like you have the business mindset of a man, you know, like there's no, there's not really a whole lot of emotion into it. And it's just A, B, C, D, and they either like it or they don't. And you just keep moving forward. And like, I mean, I love that about you. Like you're, you're, you know what you need, want, and you know how to help people, you know, you know, the business and you're content. You know, you're just very, you know, content. And I, I love, I just love that about you. But of that variety where you were talking about, where would you say you make the most money? Uh, the most money are on high-end youth horses. Oh. And that can be like, uh, I sold an NFR horse, went to a junior hire. The youth market on a high-end horse is really my best market. Something that is youth suitable that can be in that top one percent at the big events. I mean that, that that's so hard to find. Like, cause I've had you text me like, "Is it you well, suitable? Is it you suitable?" And I'm like, "Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what that means. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I don't have kids, and I I don't think kids should be riding anyways. <laughs> like, I'm like, it's just a dangerous sport. Like, so and then you know I'll see a kid get on a horse. Um, there's one girl that has won a bunch that has that got on a horse that I had gotten on and tried and I thought for sure this was a Thomas and Mac horse I would never have put a kid on it but I mean they go it's you know horses some horses just know I think they do, they do. you know and, and that, that will get me in trouble too because all in my mind think there's no way that this horse could possibly and I've tried to work on myself I, I try to expand my thought on things you know i'll get i'll kind of get tunnel vision on stuff and i'm really i always stay worried about youth 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 customers i should have gray hair (laughs) i should have gray hair from you you worrying about youth but i have found and and it was the same thing for me when i was a youth i i rode a horse that was notoriously rank amongst men team ropers they were like oh my god my dad caught a lot of crap for me riding him because he was known to be true enough kid he's just known to be bad he fit me Mm -hmm. he fit me and those horses do have when you have that connection between that horse uh, i sold one uh, about four months ago and this was a high-end horse but she was definitely technical She's trained by an individual that has horses that have gone to the NFR. She rides a certain way. These horses just almost have a bond with her, and they're they're very difficult to place Mm -hmm. because of that bond. They're Mm -hmm. not a user-friendly, they're not a jump rider kind of horse. They are a one-on-one, which are hard, but Mm -hmm. she's she's a good, good mare. And this youth came in here, and she came to look at a, a different one, and this is the one she wanted, and I was like, oh... Okay, we'll try this because I've got to keep an open mind on this. And that mare, the minute she saw her, I mean, this mare is kind of cold, um, doesn't have the the me personality, was mad because she was in here. These horses, when people think that they mm-hmm. they uh, don't understand and they're being sold, you're, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. They, they understand it. Some are like, yay, I'm ready to go to somebody else. And some of them are like, 
I was a good whore. I did my job, and here I am being sold. Right. They don't understand for a little while that hey, we're your buddies, and we're gonna we're gonna find you a perfect home. Mm-hmm. It took her a while to kind of warm up around. She never really did warm up, but she got to this youth, and it was like. She was at home. She was like, oh, and they have done great. So sometimes you just got to sit back and see, because those, those youth riders, and, and not just youth, but some adults, those deals come around that you don't expect, and mm-hmm. they'll make you eat your hat. You'll think, there's no way that's going to work. And yeah, it did. <laughs> I see. I know. I've had that happen, which is a, a huge blessing. Um I like I had a conversation with some friends about a week ago about selling horses, but as professionals, because there are other professional barrel racers too, had been to the NFR, that in order to like we felt like in order to make the NFR or be at that elite level with a horse, that you do have to have that connection. And kind of what I'm running into now which I'm getting back into the rodeo. I'm kind of getting the bug again. So I might want to, you know, I might want to go. So I might keep them. But I, you know, I kind of got burnt out and wanted my horses to go on still and be on the road. And they deserved to, you know, compete in that elite competition. So then I decided, okay, I'm going to go home and I'll just train them and I'll season them. And then I'll sell them to somebody who wants to go. And what I ran, what I ran into is that I am purposely not having a connection with those horses because I know that they're going to leave and therefore they're not going to reach their full potential with me because you have to have that connection in order to get them to that full potential. I think, and that, I mean, that's how I've been successful and that's how my friends that, you know, we're having that conversation have been successful. Have you had that experience? Well, what, what hurts me is, you know, because I'm training on my horses at the same time, because what I do is I, I see something I like, whether, whatever age it is, and I buy it and I put my time in on it. And a lot of the times it's a, you know, a three or four or five year old and I'll bring it along and you know, it'll take me four or five years to get them to where they are a sellable where I feel comfortable and kind of get along with them and they're going to win and everything. And you have to have that wall, you know, mm-hmm. that you've got to have that detachment and it's just a killer on there. I mean, it, it does, it, it gets to me, you know, uh, but what I have to do is focus in on, they're going to somebody else that's going to win on them and they're going to, they're going to do well. And that's how I kind of separate myself from them. But that it is an issue. And, uh, even for me and, and I've sold horses forever. I mean, I, I sold my pony, I sold my pony at six, you know, so it's like, you know, I, I, I get it. That's how we earned a living. But that bond, um, is, is definitely hard on you. I, I tell you the hardest thing about selling horses though, are the vet checks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The vet checks. Because you'll have the perfect horse. Uh, and this happened three weeks ago. I had a novice woman that I knew a horse that fit him perfectly. She's not going to be going to um, very many events. The horse, you just had to do maintenance. You know, uh, there's some areas that just don't want to do injections, don't want to do, they just don't want to do any maintenance on them. And, um, this horse, you know, when, when you're looking at a certain price range and you're wanting a certain age range and then you're needing them to be very user friendly and still run at a, a 2D, 3D level and be in the bargain bin, it's hard to fill those orders. And then when you have them go, well, they saw this little thing on the vet check. The vet checks are so difficult, so difficult. And I see a lot of people miss out on the perfect horse that would have done exactly what they wanted to the level that they needed and, and been a good placement. And then the whole deal is just crashed and burned because they see something, you know, the vet checks anymore, the, the machinery, your x-rays, your son, everything is so elite. Now they're seeing every little pimple on these horses. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that they're not going to be, a good horse Mm -hmm. it's just something else that the vet can say i see this 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 and this but your vet needs to say but i can maintain this this and this this is what the longevity should be yeah Yeah. Um, but for a for a customer especially people were getting first first in the industry and and in their mind they're spending x amount whether it be under ten thousand or over a hundred thousand they're first getting in they hear the words, 
I see this and mm-hmm. they, it just shuts off. It's like, right. And, and then, the first thing I hear about what you're saying or that I can relate to about what you're saying is there are, and people don't realize this, but there are vets who have specialties and there's a vet who's, who's a vet to find something you know, and that's like, that's their goal in life. And then there's vets that are performance horse vets. And if you're going to be on the road and you're going to be competing, you need a performance horse vet in order to, you know, keep, um, keep the horses going. And same thing with us. Like, I mean, I'm sore. I'm sore. Like I have had back surgeries and, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, I have, I have a, um, a bone spur on C1 that if my neck goes out, it'll touch my brainstem. And all hell breaks loose, <laughs> you know. And so, like, I have to go to the chiropractor once a week. Hmm? Kissing spine surgery for you. Yeah, I have so much heart. I have so much heart. I have like secretariat <laughs> heart. <you know? laughs> but that's what you got to realize. So, what yeah. what you or what that person is willing to deal with? Like, I never go into a vet check, and I really want people to hear this. I never go into a vet check expecting it to be clean. I go into it wondering what they have because they're going to have something. If they've been trying that hard for somebody, if they've been doing their job and they have heart, they're going to have something. They're going to have some type of wear and tear that needs maintained. So I go into a vet check saying, is this something that I'm willing to deal with for X amount of years or this horse's career or what I, whatever it is that I'm wanting to do with it? And um, for example, and I'm super open, you know that, like um, my horse, Angel. So when I vet checked her, she came up with, she was born with a deformation in her hock. And then she had, uh, you know, a meniscus flap that just needed taken off. That's different than like a meniscus repair. But this mare, she was only five and she had won so much. Like with, with yeah. her owner. I'm like, oh my, like this, this bee has some serious heart, you know? And I couldn't wait to see what she would do, like not being in that pain. Because especially when they're born with something, like they don't know any different. Right. And so I couldn't wait. So when I did my back, um, when I had my back procedures, I had her stuff done. And then, um, I think our second run back, we won 25,000 at the pink buckle. And then I made circuit finals on her twice since then. And, you know, I knew what I, and I honestly, she doesn't take any maintenance. Like after I had her stuff done, she doesn't take any more maintenance than my other horses have. So, um, and I just, gosh, I wish that people, and they don't, they don't understand, you know what I mean? Um, unless, I mean, we've been doing this our whole lives. So we've been doing horses, right? Our whole lives. So we, we understand that. And I, the vet check thing is so hard. So with that said, and I know we're kind of running out of time, but with that said, do you ever send, like I did, um, do you ever send the x-rays to somebody before they ever get on the horse? If it's a high end horse, Mm -hmm. You know, and say, you can't even get on it unless you're okay with these extras. Not that they can't vet check it after, you know what I mean? But you have to be okay with, you know, what we already know this horse has before you ever step on it. Yeah, yeah, I try. You know, ideally, I have x-rays on file before, you know, when when somebody's interested in a horse, I'll say, here's the x-rays, have them checked out. You know, ideally, they send me the horses with some x-rays or some history, and and I try to always know what the maintenance is you know whatever it is i don't i don't care what it is if the horse has to run on lasix so be it i'll sell it to people that can manage lasix mm-hmm. if they can't then we're going to skip that horse you know because i don't want somebody to get something they can't manage or won't manage because it's just going to be a terrible thing down the road but on the vet checks it is hard for people that are not used to being in the business to understand what it requires for the girls that are running up down the road like you they understand and they don't expect them to be perfect but the industry that i'm in which is like i said a lot of the youth starting out high end they uh they kind of get that 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 tunnel vision towards whatever that vet and and that's why i I enjoy some of these vets that are so much easier to work with like like josh harvey explains it to them in an easier manner this is what we're going to do here's our maintenance here's our longevity Mm-hmm. That that worked so much better. And, and for a backup, Cody and my son Matt, we have never had a steer wrestling horse ever pass a vet check that we bought for him, <laughs> ever. Right. And, you know, and, and one vet, one of the first ones we bought for him, the vet said, "Run! Don't 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 even put this horse in the trailer. <laughs> right. Do not fire the horse." And we went, 
we're buying the horse. I mean, he fits. We do not care. Yeah. We just want to know what we got to fix here and how long we've got. You know, and that horse ended up, oh my gosh, he's 25 years old and he still steer rests. Like, right. Did circuit final. He made you it. Know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that don't know, Cody is an NFR steer wrestler and um, Sabrina is his mom. And she's talking about the horses that, you know, they have gotten for Cody um, in order to make the NFR. And they, they do, you know, some of them do last forever. Now, and some of them, they can pass a vet check with flying colors and not last forever and, and be you know, exactly. hurt the next day. I don't know any high-end horse. I do not know any high-end horse that doesn't have something that's going to be ugly on an x-ray or an ultrasound or something. There's, yeah. If they are, they're, they're magic horse. They're magic, <laughs> they're magic horse. horse. <laughs> No, I'm like, if they are, that's when I raise my eyebrow. Like, if a horse is passing a vet check with flying colors and all the x-rays are clean, I'm like, mm, I don't know. Oh. I don't think this horse has enough. Is it, she's not giving her all. This horse isn't giving their all. So yeah. the one time yes. I ever had a horse pass a vet check with flying colors that I was purchasing, it did not work out. She did not have heart. She And I sold her because she didn't have that grit that I needed for her to have at the elite pro level and from now on when they pass it I almost leave I'm like oh they passed Uh oh (laughs) I'm out I'm out (laughs) I go to these vet checks and they go to do their flexion and if that horse is 100% on the flexion I'll tell them you probably need to pull blood because if you're not seeing something somewhere there's probably a you know there's something because you know rarely can you go trot a horse on rocks Mm -hmm. or pavement and turn them in in a hard long trot and not see something if if anything they should balance and be shorter (laughs) as they're turning to balance on pavement you know if they're just free falling out there i'm I'm like oh you know hmm. so i don't know that the the vet checks are my biggest downfall on trying to explain how they need to go ahead and buy the horse regardless and luckily Luckily, my down my, my, my people understand when mm-hmm. I say buy the horse, mm-hmm. they just buy the horse. Well, you've built a clientele. You know, you've built a clientele that's turned into a family for you. And so, and your family yeah. trusts you. And they trust that if it doesn't work out, you're going to have their back as well. That's true. That is true. I should have gray hair. <laughs> for somebody <laughs> that, um, for somebody that's starting out and kind of wants to get in the horse brokering business, what advice would you mm-hmm. give them? Don't get hungry. Don't get hungry. Don't compromise what you know is not going to fit just to make Mm -hmm. a sale. I like that. Now, would you compromise a price for somebody that you know is a a really good fit? Like, will you go down on a price if you know it's a good fit and you just want them to have it? (laughs) I've made that mistake. I'm not doing it anymore. Like, I have done that with almost all my horses, and I'm, like, done. I'm, like, I can't. Like, I'm not making money, all because I want to make everyone happy. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, you know, it depends on the situation, but we had a fraternity cult that we really liked. And this woman flew in here from New Jersey, and she literally could not get on the horse. She brought cash. She had everything in order. She went to get on it, and she's pulling his head around, trying to hold the rein to put her foot in the stirrup at the same time. And we're like, Mm -hmm. you do not need a fraternity belt. This is not a good fit. She was mad at me for not letting her have the horse. And this this has been a long time ago. I think the colt was like 35,000. And uh, we ended up a week later, (laughs) we took again. It was a it was a woman who had just gone through a divorce for her daughter. The daughter fit the horse. They did not have enough money. We got we got oh Cajun spices. We got jewelry. Oh. We got, <laughs> yeah. You got chickens got and the family cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to make the deal swing and you know, but the way I looked at it, in the long run, the kid was going to be good advertisement, which she was. Mm-hmm. Um, she she made she made us more sales because she took that same horse and uh, a high end NFR guy saw the horse and tried to buy it from him, and I was like, no, no, <laughs> your deal, <laughs> you, you're going to be advertisement. Yeah. So things like that work. It's just yeah, I'll, you know, depends on the situation. And there's some situations if you come at me like. You know, before you even looked at the horse or anything and 
and shoot me in the foot, well, then don't even come. Don't don't even show up. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll have people that, you know, they'll say, well, you've got the horse marked at 50. Would you take 30? I know. No. <laughs> I had one guy tell me, oh, I understand horses on the Internet, that the prices are actually half of what you post them. I went, Really? I did not know this. How do you manage those people? Do you still look at them as clients or do you just kind of shrug them off? Uh, Depends. (laughs) (laughs) There are, there are people that you can read and go, they are not, they're just window shoppers and, uh, and they're nosy. There'll be a lot of people Mm -hmm. in this, in this, in, and that's why I won't post horses names on the internet and, you know, I may post like the prices, and if that's the price range you're in, then we're gonna we'll discuss. Mm-hmm. But I'm not gonna go put a horse out there and put their names out there so that all the barrel racers can you know go around and then find out who bought that horse and then say they gave they gave X amount for that horse. That's not the way I operate. Speaking about that, there's a the big drama right now, which I probably shouldn't ask you, but I'm going to because I want to know what you think about it. Um, you know, the whole. Um, Oh, the epic leader horse. Why am I why am I spacing his name? Oh. <laughs> yeah, like what do you like my take on that is probably so different than what everybody else thinks. And that's be I think that's just because I've been in the business and I also don't have kids. So I mean what's your take on it? I'm I'm not even gonna go <laughs> there. Not, it, not. It, you know, that that's another reason that I'm not drugged through the dirt is because I just People will ask me, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? I'm mean, like, Mm-mm, nothing. Uh, yeah. And I learned that I learned that from Robert Epbauer. When I sold horses for Robert, I'd ask him, you know, like, well, what about this? What about that? And he'd go, well, don't get me to lie. I, you know, I just, he just, <laughs> <laughs> I just go, okay, if you just, you, you know, just to stay in that straight and narrow, I just don't even, I, I, I try not to, you know, bash other brokers. Mm-hmm. I try not to. Uh, I never cut their throat, like, and and I and I learned this from Martha Josie of all people. Um, I had a horse that I was selling, and the people went to Martha and asked her about the horses, and and she said she sells very nice horses. She's a great person, and I was like, oh my God, I'm so such... and Matt Lowe, yeah, what an honor, what an honor Aww. right there. She yeah, she said I think you ought to buy that horse, and Aww. and here they were looking at horse so. Um, mm-hmm. I, I learned that a long time ago, and Matlock Rose was the same way. You know, I learned from the legends. Just, just keep your nose clean and uh, stay out of it. And stay, stay out of it. Especially the barrel well, the drama. Other than that, like not your take on like the drama part of it, but does that instill fear in you at all, or or do you just you know keep going day day by day, see what God brings you? Yeah, I I have total faith. Total faith. Whatever happens, happens, and it's going to all work out. I never worry about it. I never worry about missing a sale because I, I know it, the horse will find the right person. I never worry about missing a, a client because mm-hmm. that probably meant that that's somebody that wouldn't really work in our program. Now, you know? have so, you ever been hungry? And your words. <laughs> Not, but have you ever been yeah, hungry yeah. and, you know, had to say no to somebody and you're like, man, like, I, I've been in that situation where I'm like, maybe this is God trying to bless me, but I knew it wasn't a good fit, and I said no. And like when you say no, man, it's hard to it's hard. You know what I mean? Those first few days after that, or a week after that, like what do you? How do you cope when you're hungry? Like what do you do? Like what's your next step then? You know what I mean? When you do say no, and you're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you hope it's it's like when you turn down a sale. You hope because it's kind of almost, almost like the kiss of death. It's like the horse will go and get crippled the next week. And, mm-hmm. You know, somebody comes up and wants your horse, and it's like, no, I don't, I don't want to. Then something happens. But I'll tell you how hungry we were. You know, when I met Marty, uh, our original Devers Performance Horses was a facility that we had built um, on the other side of, of Perryton, and we and, and I got a picture because I always wanted to remember where we started at. We had, and this is before cell phones, you know, everybody's got a cell phone. On. This is before cell phones, you had a landline. I, I literally had a feed bucket with a, a phone sitting on top of it, and we'd be in the arena riding, and we'd hear the phone ring. We'd have to get out and run over there to the feed bucket to answer the phone because we had no house. We just had the phone. <laughs> 
the arena and the phone. Your two necessities. <laughs> and the phone. And what, you know, yeah, we needed to make sales back then. I mean, like, at that point, this is so far back there. We sold horses for 1500 mm -hmm. You know, you'd buy them for 800 900 10 And then you'd sell them for 1500 But we sold them at the sales. Right. We would sell them at Rovis and horse sales. Mm -hmm. Those horses that we did not feel comfortable with either a keeping in training or selling to someone else they went to the sale and we never put our name on it interesting so we kept our name clean interesting. you know it's you know you know it, it, at that time in 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 our history you know you were trying you were doing good to you know clear 500 on a horse mm -hmm. and you know you needed every nickel you made so that you could buy more inventory right well when you're dealing in those cheaper end horses, you're going to get trash. That's just all there is to it. You're going to find that horses that you bought, uh, you know, flipping in the box, you know, running off with you, stuff like and you'd go, mm-hmm, to the sale. Mm -hmm. And I learned that from Ed Wright. And you never, Ed like, Wright. you don't send them off for, you know, to get better broke or anything like that. Like, you're just, you just kind of wipe your hands of it. Move on to the next I, one. Luckily, luckily, I haven't had to sell a horse into a sale ring in gosh 30 years this was back when we were hungry mm -hmm. you ask when we were hungry these were the early beginnings of Deborah's performance a long time ago <laughs> you know before you could go on the internet and go check out a horse before you mm -hmm. could go and really do a history on that horse this was when you the the main market was that you would go to like the ada horse sale or the clovis horse sale and you would buy those horses mm -hmm. and then you know trade amongst yourself and, and it was before clovis um uh, well i'm not gonna say that because it would sound bad uh, it, you you had a lot of traders involved mm -hmm. so uh, those horses you know, they, they'd slide them by you, you mm -hmm. know, you, they, and that's part of how you learn what to look for because you've had stuff pulled on you and you look at it now from a buyer standpoint. Now, what, what would I, what would make me really mad if I got home with a horse like this? So, but that's what we did when we were hungry and, and a long, long time ago, not now, not now, <laughs> but long time ago, we would send them to, send them to the horse sale and, uh, and Ed Wright would do that same thing. Ed, he would take horses in on trade. My dad shod for Ed, and my dad's a very famous horseshoe, like very famous. And so I was lucky to be around mm -hmm. the big name and learn how they made a go of the industry. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, Ed Ed would take horses in on trade, and, uh, and he would uh, eliminate them. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't even look back. He'd be like, they're out of here. Mm -hmm. And so I learned that. I learned that. I have to say, you know, to, to the listeners... I, well, like you and I both have had so much opportunity in being around, you know, the elite in this business, but like competitively, horse sale wise, like we, we can be around anybody that we want to be around and ask the questions and learn from them. And, um, you know, I didn't really, really realize that till I quit. And I like kind of stayed home for a while. And I realized, you know, all these people, they don't have the, those opportunities. So I try to tell people like, if you ever do see somebody that, you know, that you admire, or that you want to learn from, do not be afraid to ask that question. Like, even if you get one sentence out of them, I mean, just, just do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Most people, most people in this industry are good. You know, Yes, there are sharks in the industry, but for the most part, they are good people, and they will try to help you. Um, and that you know, they're they're trainers that are they're going to give you advice, whether you take it or not is your choice. Right. Most of the time, they're not going to say, "Oh, you know, look at you, strange and right off." They're going to say, "You know, here's what I would do, or here's what I've done." Yeah. Do you think that I feel like the elite of the elite get a bad? rep or a bad name because if you're climbing that ladder or you're just starting out I think there's a lot of insecurity involved and that you're just insecure about yourself and so anything that anybody tells you or how they look at you in the warm-up pen or anything like that feels like um like you're getting stabbed you know what I mean or there's and really it's not that like every the reason the elite of the elite are are champions because because they don't, they just concentrate on the steps it takes to be a champion, and it doesn't have anything to do with the other competition. I have never in my right. life been in competition with somebody else. 
I am always, it's what I can do on this horse today on that pattern, period. And I want to do my best. I can win first and be upset with myself if I mess something up. You know what I mean? Because I'm not winning, you know, my competition isn't the other people. And that's, I feel like that's the majority of, of, uh, you know, people's process that are at that level. And so, yeah, I feel like, you know, people just, you know, I mean, just, just ask and go ride with people and don't take anything personally. And, you know, just take one step at a time. If you take one step at a time forward, you're, you're eventually going to get somewhere. Well, I find like, uh, like when you go to the big events and you've got your, your bigger name trainers in there, it's kind of funny. A lot of them will stand off by themselves because they are trying to figure out what am I doing? Cause they're running, is there a horse, whatever they're trying, they're concentrating. They're not being stuck up. They're just doing their own deal. And another thing, they're trying to kind of stay off by themselves because there gets to be drama. You know, a lot of times there's, and they're just trying to just stay off by this. But the ones that I see do the power play are usually the people that are not professionals that are the drama, the drama people. Mm-hmm. And, and they're the ones that will be the get stuff started up and, and be like, well, so-and-so over there, you know, they just think they're so good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it's people that it's not really the elites causing you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's the in-betweens <laughs> or that lower, that lower level. Or... Like somebody else's yeah. You know? and, then, and, and they'll never be, they'll never be an elite. The elites, mm-hmm. it's, it's just like your world champions. And, and we, when we raised our kids, we wanted them to be around like the Roy Duvals, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all of the world champions to get that to rub off on you. Yes. You get that, 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 the, that feeling that you are confident, you know, you're good. That you energy. Go yeah. You that vibration. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's. You don't bad mouth somebody else to to be up here you already know you're up here Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah and you've known like I get my confidence from um just doing the work and then um and also now like when you're that I guess I got my confidence when I was climbing the ladder from doing the work and it wasn't really about building my confidence it was more about learning like I loved to learn and I knew that I wanted to take my talent um, that God gave me to the highest level that I could, that I would do the most I could with that specifically. So I pride aside, you know, I, I'd ask for help. There's many times I asked for help and that's what, that's what made me make the NFR because I was, had a horse that was running off with me, you know what I mean? In Canada and couldn't afford to get home. So we got to fix it and win something <laughs> because I got to get home, you know? And, um, and I asked, I remember I asked Kim Schultz and she helped me and we, won the first round at Pinoca. Like, it was just, you know, I mean, just, I, I loved being stuck out on the road and being in binds because if you're in a bind, that's when you're pushed to to do what would normally make you uncomfortable, and that's how you progress. Well, see, now for rodeo to me, and I'll tell my students this, and I have students everywhere from age four to 74, so the wide range. I'll, I'll tell my girls that's on the road, you know, you're not riding hungry. Now, there's that hungry in, in the good sense. You've gotten too lax mm-hmm. because you're not, you're, you don't have to go in, to, you know, to make your entry fees. There is a benefit to having to go in mm-hmm. in order to excel. Yes. When you when you can't go buy another horse, you can't go fix. You know, this is you know, you can't just have a, a quick fix on swapping out horses. You, you got to fix what you got. And that's riding hungry, and, and that's really where you kind of, to me, develop being a trainer at that point. Yes, yeah, and I learned so much trying to fix, not just fix horses, like, with huge problems, but just basically trying to pick up one-tenth at a time in order to be at that level. For me, yeah. it might not be that I was hungry in the sense for I had to win to go to the next one. That only happened to me a few times. <laughs> but I always have told people, or I tell myself, that my goal need, my goal is not big enough. Like if I'm not, you know, giving everything challenged. I can, if I'm not challenged, my goal is not big enough. I'm not going to ride how you would, you know what I mean? And uh, it's hard to stay home and have big goals because I mean, what, what is there to do? You know what I mean? When, when you're at the house. So, um, I, lo- I just, you know, 
it's fun talking about the elite and, and you and I being around them and then just, you know, hanging around high vibrational people and where that takes you. And speaking of, you know, where things have taken you from being hungry to where your performance horse um, business is now, like what is next? What do you have that goal that keeps you hungry? You know, uh, I'm in such a comfortable spot right now. It's, you know, we, we did 5.2 million in sales during the COVID year. And that was with Arizona, Canada, California, all of those places shut down. I did, you know, and, and I sell trucks and trailers too. There's a few Schwabi trucks and stuff, but for the most part, that was just horse sales. That is a lot, you know, I, you know, it, you think back how you started out and, you know, for an annual, if you sold $10,000 worth of horses, it'd be like, oh my God, you know, we'd rung the bell to, to where it is now. I'm in a comfortable position and that's why I can, you know, it's, it's kind of the fruit of your labors. I've got such a good customer base. I've got customers that I can call them up and they may not be looking for a horse and I'll say, Hey, I got one that fits you and you need to put this in your barn and make a sale that, that will promote. It's kind of that rolling effect will promote us on the next sale by placing that horse in the right spot. So, my goals for right now, because I'm getting at that point, you know, I was, you know, I take six to eight head of horses and now I'm down to going to five at these deals. I'm, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit. It really aggravates me, but I'm, uh, I know I need to ride fewer to ride better. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do that. Uh, but I would like to, I would like to make a few more good ones. Mm -hmm. that somebody can really go on with you know when we were talking about you like to do the younger horses and get them and and, and send them on to other people and people don't believe that about you <laughs> uh, it, i'm like just me. go so i don't have to like i like to <laughs> bake the banana bread at home like <laughs> but. i i like to i like to get these horses in and it's like a box of chocolates you 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 eat one and you go, oh, that was a cherry one. And figure out how to make that horse work. Fix that horse to excel them. And I really, I really, really like bringing along the new generation. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my goal. I would like to have something, and I mean, this is way out there, but I would like to have something like Josie, Josie World yeah. has. Something kind of a, kind of bringing those youth. You know, Kaminsky did that with the KK. Mm -hmm. I think that's just cool. They're cool. I, I would like to promote the industry so that when I'm gone, there's something out there that still, you know, they can say, you know, she helped the industry. Yeah. And I don't care if it was for somebody in the horse show business or the barrel business, just so that they had that feel for those horses. You know, that's just the coolest thing. I, I, I like getting people started and getting a, getting that basis for them. That, that's my goal. I would like to have something that would... uh Oh, are you there? Oh, I can't hear you. Yes. Oh, there you are. So um, I could 100% see that for you. And um, I think it's really cool. And you would never, you know, God never like shows you the end picture, the middle picture when you're starting something out. And you started out a horse selling business, training and selling business. And now what I'm hearing is that you really enjoy coaching and you really enjoy bringing people up and you want to, and like, yeah. that is your main passion now. Uh, matching them with the horses they can go in on. And I, I, it, it excites me every Monday when they start sending in, I won this, mm -hmm. I did that. I get my videos back in here. What do you, you know, what do I need to work on? I, you know, I like coaching them to be winners. I really do. And, and you know, I like I like having a part like, uh, you know, Emily Bissell's one of my shining stars. You know, she's a good kid, not just inside the arena, but outside the arena. I like for people to be developed into good individuals and, and be good to their horses. And that's, that's where I really like to be. I'd like to uh, continue selling a lot of high end horses that, that works for me, but I would like those, uh, those new generations coming up to have a, uh, have some knowledge. 
I'm excited for you. I can see, I can already visualize it coming and I'm, I'm so excited for you. Um, I love Emily. I was just thinking about that the, uh, at that slot race in Oklahoma City. I'm like, man, Emily knows exactly what type of horses she gets along with because like everyone she runs, like they just fit her so well. And that's what it takes to win. And like, I, I remember a time where I got super prideful where I'm like, oh, I want to learn how to ride different horses and this and that. And that's cool and all, but you, in order to be, um, at the top level, you have to figure out what fits you and excel with that. And that's something right. that you help people do. I, I like to, I like to say, well, you know, if you, if you just set down one half step sooner, you know, and see that horse and that person evolve, that's, that's the thing that's really cool when you can, you can break that pattern down and say, okay, this is going to take you to that next level. That really, it's just like doing a puzzle, you know, yes. whether that horse needs this or that person needs this. I was just thinking that, um, that analogy, like the same, the same thought process on in order to be a trainer, if you're with horses or you're barrel racing or you're doing anything with horses, you better like puzzles. That's you have to like that because the puzzle is the process. I mean, once you're once it, yep. once it's finished, it's finished. <laughs> you know, you move on to another puzzle. But yeah, exactly, exactly. Go figure out something else on on somebody else or a different horse or something. That that's that keeps me sharp, and I like to develop. I like to see what's what is changing because this industry is always changing. You know, I had I had some students. I used to have ladies' day back when I lived in Odessa, and I was doing my clinics when I was 16, 15 and 16 down there. And, you know, I'll have people that I haven't seen in 30, 40 years say, well, you know, you told me to ride like this. And it's like, are you still riding the same way? That- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's, that's so 2003. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, but I like staying up at the times and, and figuring out, you know, I'll sit there and, and watch, I'll watch, you talking about the elite, I'll watch them in the warm-up pens, and I'll watch them, and I'll break down their videos, and I'll study every step that they do, and every motion with their hand, and, and you know, I, I, of course, I'm a, I'm a bit hoarder, too, I love bits, but I will study the event, I like to, I like to figure out what made somebody win. And that's what, so that's what it takes for you to be as successful as you are. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day because you're clearly got a lot going on to, you know, help all of us learn and kind of have that backstage uh, sight into what it takes to be professional trainer, professional coach, professional um, broker. Thank you, Sabrina. Well, thank you for having us in the time. Absolutely. Just remember, right, to stay hungry. Stay hungry. <laughs> stay hungry. Stay hungry. Stay hungry and fearless. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll talk Great. to you. I'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.